Thank you for the introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, if I start to speak too quickly, slow me down, right? Um, I'm Welsh, not English. Which means I'm looking for a Croatian you know, football shirt to wear tonight, right? So no matter what happens, as long as England lose, as a general um, but Welsh is spoken far faster than English, and we tend to do the same, so feel free to slow me down. Uh, what I want to do is to really express a level of concern about the current state of the Agile movement. I think it's actually at the end of its life cycle, and I'll explain why. Having done that, I want to talk a little bit about how things go through different life cycles and how you recognize it and then start to look at some of the new tools and new techniques which are coming out, which are designed to reinvent the field. Yeah? So that's the plan. And I picked the theme from this, um, the song from the Kinks. I was a pre, pre teen when this came out, right? I, yeah. When you get older, you like to remember these periods. Um, but it was produced, actually written by Ray in one night because he got really fed up with people who followed fashion but couldn't care less about utility, yeah? And kind of like that's where Agile is at the moment. Yeah, dedicate his followers of fashion. It's the latest thing, the latest accreditation course. Now, I've said for many years now, the problem with Agile is that people are more concerned to do training and get certificates than they are to produce software. Yeah? Um, and I'll go through some of the reasons for that. The other thing we're starting to see at the moment is the commodification of Agile. Now, I'm in my mid-60s now, I've seen management movements come and go, and the common characteristic of the end of days is that they become commodified. Things become standardized, the big consultancy, consultancies move into the field. Yeah. It moves from a lot of very small people who think differently into a commodification process. And two examples of this, this is from McKinsey's. Um, <laughs> What they're currently doing is assembling a group of platitudes which they only partially understand into guidelines. Right? Uh, and you can see the examples here. The worst one which came out only two days ago is this. It basically the five trademarks of agile organizations. Now if you've been around for more than two or three decades, I can go back and see the McKinsey's approach to knowledge management, the McKinsey's approach to blue ocean strategy, McKinsey's approach to business process re-engineering all had identical words on them. <laughs> it really hasn't changed in five decades. It's deeply depressing, right? Um, the whole idea is that every four or five years, they need you to decide to become something else. Yeah? So now you have to be agile. And the reality is, it's just recycling the old material. And there's a kind of underlying theme here. If anybody's read um, Animal Farm by George Orwell, you remember the animals rebel. Um, and this is um, Ralph Steadman's cartoon version of it, which you haven't seen is brilliant. Um, at the end, the animals look in through the farm window and they see that the humans and the pigs are now actually all the same people, right? It really hasn't changed. Yeah. And if you look at things like SAFE, which is probably the most greatest travesty on Agile ever committed, it's effectively a way of making Agile into a waterfall technique to make IT directors comfortable. It's actually not about agility. Um, it only works because consultants ignore it and use it as a cover to get ideas in. Yeah, and that's not sustainable. So let's look at some of this stuff. Right? One of the big problems we had when Agile came out is it starts with people like XP, people like Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries, all right, so the XP movement. But it really takes off with Scrum. And part of the problem is XP is probably closer to the tradition, but the problem with XP people is they can't talk with ordinary mortals. <laughs> yeah, but they, they kind of like live in a form of symbiosis with computer code, which distances from other people. So we get Scrum, and Scrum is a structured technique, and I want to say now it's one of the most valuable techniques I've ever seen. I have a huge amount of time for it within boundaries. Yeah? But let's look at two things. I want to first of all make a point. Right? 
Uh, this is probably the greatest number three um, prop forward of all time. Um, for those of you who don't know your rugby, and by the way, Germany is starting to get quite a useful team together. I'm looking forward to this, all right? Maybe the failure in football would encourage you to go to a real school. <laughs> Um, this is the heart of a scrum. It's the least agile aspect of the whole game of rugby, right? The front row forwards, of whom this guy is one, all right, they're evolved to have no neck. It's very dangerous to have a neck in the front of the scrum. There's a thing called scrum pox, which is a fungus disease you get by rubbing heads together in this very rigid structure, right? So, kind of like, we probably chose the wrong metaphor here, right? And Agile is more about those guys at the back who run around and the way it works. But this is from a survey about the state of scrum run in 2008, yeah? Um, by, guess who, the Scrum Alliance. Now, of course, this is a completely disinterested party, you understand, so this is objective research. But what they found is that 85% of people think that Scrum improves the quality of life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, personally, I think beer probably does it better, but that's a different <laughs> um, 71% say delivering value to customers is most important to executives. Well, what the hell do the other 29% think about? <laughs> this is kind of like significantly worried. Oh, and guess what? 81% think certification improves practice, right? Now, how you can call yourself a master of anything if you go through a two-day course and fill out a multi-choice question on an open book exam over the next five weeks? That's to degrade the term of master and undermine the whole concept of apprenticeship. It's actually acquiring badges. Yeah, rather than doing anything real. And then guess what? 97% think they will continue to use Scrum in the future. Right? So that's the optimistic side. <laughs> now let's look at a survey of chief executive officers. And a metaphor here of effectively being a wolf in sheep's clothing, all right? Trying to pretend to be agile but being normal. And let's look at this. 12% of agile projects are failing completely. 37 billion was estimated that likely waste in the UK alone from agile projects. Yeah. Upfront planning, distributed teams, major causes of problem. 68% yeah. agree agile needs more architects. I'll come back to that at the end. Architecture is the big missing piece at the moment <laughs> yeah, in terms of the way things work. And then finally, the average CIO has a life expectancy of 14 months. <laughs> now the trouble is that's for two reasons. One is the good guys fail, and the bad guys move on every 12 months so they can leave the mess for somebody else to clear up. As a common characteristic in large organizations, and I worked for IBM for seven years, and you really start to understand bureaucracy when you work for IBM, right? Seven years in IBM, and the US government feels dynamic and non-bureaucratic. <laughs> <laughs> the phenomenon we saw there frequently is somebody would move in, launch a major initiative, promising wonderful things in the future, and then would get the hell out before it actually came to fruition. And they basically jumped from initiative to initiative, because what they wanted to do is to talk about how it would be successful, but not take responsibility for the implementation. There are two reasons for that. Now, all of that is a problem, and part of it is overclaim. So this is from Google, uh, David Jeske. This is engineer and director of Google. This is hardly an unsuccessful person. And he makes the point that Agile is really successful for you know, high iteration, short cycle, high custom interaction work. But it won't handle underlying long-term infrastructure projects. And the problem is, everybody had to be agile. I was working with Telstra in Australia. Uh, you didn't get promoted unless you were agile. I mean, that was the current fashion. Uh, they had waterfall projects where they knew exactly what they needed to do, but it would take two years to do it. So in order to be agile, they created one-year sprints. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. It kind of like, you know, you idiots want us to play these games, we'll play the games, all right? That's the way it works. And, and I think part of the claim is the overclaim for what Agile does. It's the failure to recognize that actually Waterfall has value, there's nothing wrong with highly structured projects, 
And also they completely forgot the work that several of us did around dynamic systems design methodology back in the 90s and the early part of the century, where there's nothing wrong with a three-month time box. Time boxes can be very useful, they don't have to be two weeks. And so what I'm going to be arguing for as we come through this is a multi-methods approach, not a single method approach. Yeah? And they're recognizing that a lot of what happened in the past has value, it's just we know its limitations. The one size fits all, I've got a method to solve the problems of life, the universe and everything, which any intelligent person knows the answer is 42 anyway, right? If you don't get that, you have to look it up. Another one, this is from Martin Fowler. This is one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. Yeah, Ron Jeffries, another one, has just come out in public in his blog and said, abandon Agile, we've lost it. Yeah. If you actually look at it, this is in Korea. Three of the Agile Manifesto authors that I know have come out in public and said it's no longer Agile. Yeah, and this concept of industrialization is a key principle on that. And I think there are several reasons for this. It's another illustration from Animal Farm, that's Napoleon. Um, four real problems. First of all, methods were conflated with principles or frameworks. Yeah. Scrum is a method, it's not a framework. It's a structure process, a way of doing things which produces a certain type of result. The trouble is, when you make a method, an ideology, you get into problems. Yeah? I'm still trying to understand the fight between Scrum and Kanban. I mean, you get them into the same room and it's kind of like, the, there's a phrase in Tolkien you may know from Lord of the Rings, doubtless to sheep, other sheep appear different, or to shepherds. Right? It, it's a good pit down, work on that one, right? Um, there's very little difference. They're both walking about backlog, they're just arguing about the representation. Yeah? So we get these method wars. Certification became the be all and end all of it. And the ultimate cynicism of SAFE, when it got started, if you did the four or five day course and paid for it, you were then authorized to deliver the three day course as long as you paid a royalty. Yeah, and that's called the pyramid selling scheme. And it played to the weakness in the Agile community of wanting to have things that they could sell and train entirely profitable. And of course, now SAFE is established, they're trying to introduce barriers around quality to stop anybody else doing to them what they did to Agile. Yeah, by interesting script. Certification is the be all and end all of it. How many people have seen people's CVs with multiple letters after their name? Where I grew up, methods after they generally implied three to five years of study, not a one-day course, or sending in a certificate, right? In terms of the way it works. Yeah, so we degraded. The other problem is it's uninformed by theory. Now this is probably a controversial item, so I'll spend some time on it. There's a whole body of agile practitioners who said theory doesn't matter, what matters is what works. Now the problem is that means people produce methods based on what they think they worked on their last three projects. Yeah? And that's just really bad science. So let me give you some basic facts. The way people report success is different from the way they report failure. We did extensive research on this when I was in IBM. We took outsourcing teams, yeah? and actually Germany was one of the areas on this. That's when I first came to Stuttgart. We took outsourcing teams and we did a lessons learned process the day before they knew when they'd won the outsourcing contract. And we repeated the same process the day after they knew. And you would think you were talking about different situations. Yeah, the way they described the situation where they didn't know whether they succeeded or failed was highly contingent. It was actually the richest data set. There was all sorts of stuff in it. If they succeeded, they retold history as a logical, structured, ordered process in which may, they made brilliant decisions and made all the right calls. If they failed, it was a series of accidents and unfortunate occurrences for which they weren't responsible. And one as we know from a whole body of cognitive neuroscience is people explain the past to meet the requirements of the present. You can't trust what people say about the past because actually the remembrance is different. 
I remember doing some field ethnography with BP. Um, this was one of those interesting experiences. I was doing one week as an apprentice model. If you really want to understand an organization, go and spend a week as an apprentice, not as a consultant. Yeah? So I'm following around one of their troubleshooters, and this is a Texan. Yeah? Um, he's very rich. He's the guy they fly out to rigs if they have fires. He's kind of like almost got his own personal helicopter. And he really didn't want me with him for a week, but John said I had to be there, and John was the CEO, so I'm following him around. And the first thing he asked me is, what's your degree? And I said, philosophy and physics. That doesn't go down well with Texan engineers, right? Um, then he asked a question about politics. Well, yeah, my, my mother was born above a whorehouse in Cardiff Docks and fought her way out with a scholarship. Yeah, so kind of like we're on the left of the spectrum and he was on the right. And then he asked a religious question and I said, do you know anything about Catholic Marxism? And shall we just say everything went downhill from that point on? <laughs> Um, I remember the first coming to Germany with the AS gay and people like that, either way. So I then get dumped into a swimming pool on Monday, right? Now, I know if I fall into the North Sea in January, I'm going to die. That's okay. I can handle it, all right? There is no need to throw me into a freezing cold swimming pool, hold me under till I can hardly breathe, and then drag me out spluttering on the side of the swimming pool on the grounds of health and safety training. I mean, this is just humiliation. And he was sat on the side laughing. But got through that. Wednesday, we get to fly up to a rig. Now, I've never been in a helicopter before, so I'm really looking forward to this. It's a bright, sunny, breezy day in Aberdeen. And so I'm really looking forward to it again. The trouble is, a bright, sunny day in Aberdeen translates into something very different when you're in the middle of the North Sea. <laughs> and I can see the rig beneath me, and I can see the helicopter landing circle. The trouble is it keeps disappearing every few minutes as a wave crashes over it. Yeah. And I'm feeling green, right? Both in terms of naivety, the colour of my skin and the contents of my stomach, which are threatening to emerge at any one moment, right? And I turn to the helicopter pilot and I say, you can't land there, can you? Right? This is a plea rather than a question. And he looked at me and said, no, I'm not going to land. And I relaxed. And he waited a minute. And then he said, I'm going to hover over it and you're going to jump. <laughs> okay, I'm an alpha male, I can't let the side down, I'm going to do this, all right? So I jump. Yeah. But I land on all fours, all right? And the Texan engineer sort of strides out of the helicopter, overconfident, I think, and just drops onto the landing by me and looks at me with this expression of extreme contempt. Yeah. I think he's been rehearsing it in front of the shaving mirror every morning, all right? And I look up in desperation. Now, this is a rig in a storm with a helicopter taking off. I've got helmets on and everything, right? And I looked at him and said, how are you going to find out what's wrong? I'm trying to do the business so I can forget about horror and hazards and things like that. And he said, I already know. He said, can't you hear it? Now, all I can hear is noise. But he could hear in what he called the music of the rig, the only known example of text and poetry. I have to get my own words back sometimes. Um, he knew immediately what was wrong. When I asked him how he knew, in the context of his knowing, I got a dozen heuristics or rules of thumb. When I interviewed him two hours later in Aberdeen, I got a structured, logical, ordered process which bore no relationship whatsoever to the way he knew things in the field. Yeah. The way we recall things is not the way we do them. And these are basic facts. So we have a real problem with empirical approaches. The other problem, and I won't go through all of these, but there's a thing called the Hawthorne effect. So basically in the 1920s, they were studying worker productivity in a cable manufacturing facility in Hawthorne in New York State. And they increased the lighting levels to see if it improved productivity, and it did. So more light, higher productivity. If they were agile consultants, they would now publish a best-selling book called Light, The Secret to the Future, and they'd have a certification course in which you got badges for the ability to switch on a light switch. Right? In those days, they had some pretensions to be real scientists, so they lowered the lighting levels, 
and people became more productive. <laughs> now the basic finding from this and other studies is if you do something <coughs> novel and pay attention to people, it will nearly always work the first couple of times. And that means that all of the question about pilot projects is fundamentally flawed. And that's before we get onto the killer punch. If you give a group of radiologists a batch of x-rays and ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray you put a picture of a gorilla which is 48 times the size of a cancer cell, 83% of the radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk to the 83%. <laughs> and it's called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see. If you're a systems analyst, I'm sorry guys, after you've done two interviews, it triggers a subconscious hypothesis, the form of cognitive activation, and you literally only hear things that match that hypothesis thereafter. Yeah? And this is the human condition. And there's good reason for it. Yeah? What you're actually doing is you're scanning a very small percentage, 5% at most of what's in front of you, and you're doing a first fit pattern match with your previous experience. And the most frequently used experiences get activated first. Now in evolutionary terms, you can see why this happens. Think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa. Something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. <laughs> Do you want to autistically scan all available data, <laughs> look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, go on a two-day certification course, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. By the time you've done all of that, the only thing which will matter, the only relevant document I know of, is the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I can find of an eyewitness record of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore. Yeah. <laughs> we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly on a partial data scan, privileging our most recent experiences. Yeah. And all of that says empirical methods are fundamentally flawed. Yeah, the approach I've developed and pioneered over the last 20 years is to use natural science as a basis for methods, because natural science is validated. Yeah? So the commodification stage is there. Now, a brief comment on architecture before I move on to some of the new ways of thinking. This is from Anne Pendleton Julian, um, MIT professor, Stanford professor. Just spent five days working with her and 40 other people in Canada on a complexity-based approach to design thinking. If you think Agile is bad, go and look at what they've done with design thinking. <laughs> they've reduced it to this highly linear process. And you know it's at the end of its life cycle, by the way, because IBM have adopted it as a strategic. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the Anne's comments, which is important, is that actually scaffolding is key, but you take scaffolding away once the building is up. There's a lovely example, by the way, if you have a really severe burn, there's now a lattice-type scaffolding which is put on the burn, which contains nutrients, and it allows the skin to rebuild around the scaffolding, but then it fades away. Yeah? One of the big problems we've got, not just in Agile, but in management generally, is the scaffolding becomes the building. Yet yeah? the methods which are designed to produce a result become the most important thing, and we don't take them away. Yeah? Now, I'm not going to go into this in depth, there's a body of new work, we'll also continue on this in Tasmania in four weeks' time, of working on how do we actually create an architectural approach in which scaffolding creates resilient and sustainable structures which don't need the scaffolding to be permanently there. Yeah, and that applies to IT and a whole body of other areas. Okay, so I sort of hit a few things, now we come on to a way of understanding it. Um, this is an American timber wolf. Uh, they were hunted to extinction, extinction in Yellowstone, and they're the apex predator, they're at the top of the predation tree. Yeah, well, probably the bears would claim some ascendancy there, but let's hold it to that. Huh? Um, if you remove the apex predator, you get what's called a trophic cascade. So basically, the deer population then magnifies out of all proportion, there's nothing to predate them. Yeah? They therefore overgraze territory, they start to graze riverbanks, 
As they grow river banks, the soil starts to crumble, the water gets polluted. Yeah, that's a trophic scale. Uh, there's a wonderful film about this if you look it up on the web, by the way. They reintroduced one pack of wolves, and within a few years, the water ran clear again. Yeah, because deer will not actually graze on a river bank if there might be a pack of wolves around. Yeah, if you remove the apex predator, everything falls. But the other problem is the apex predator is over-optimized for the ecology into which they're a part. And if that breaks down, the apex predator doesn't survive. So we go to dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, I should say I'm sensitive about this at the moment. I'm working with the Ebola management teams in the USA, and I'm not allowed to mention evolution because it's a controversial theory. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is deeply depressing if you think about it, all right? Um, either way, so the meteor comes and destroys the Earth, right? You see, it wipes out the dinosaurs. If you had to predict who the next apex predator would be based on past practice, you go for the crocodile or the shark that survive, you wouldn't go for the first mammal. But when the system radically changes, something very small and highly energy efficient becomes the next apex predator. And then the system organizes around the apex predator so they survive no matter how incompetent they are thereafter. <laughs> okay, so let's look at that in terms of what it means. So you've probably all seen life cycle curves, yeah? So life cycle curves look like this. And the idea is here you have two and a half percent of the market. Yeah. This is called early adopters. You then get early majority, which is 13 and a half percent. Yeah, anybody seen this sort of stuff before? Yeah. You then get this group here called late majority, and I can't remember the percentage. And then here you get really sad people. <laughs> We we'll only buy things when everybody else has realized it's the end of the utility. Uh, this these days is government, by the way. The big consultancy firms actively teach this. This is not me being cynical. This is me reporting fact. When you can't sell it to industry anymore because they know it doesn't work, sell it to government as industrial best practice and put your second-rate consultants on it. Okay. So that's a classic life cycle curve. A guy called Jeffrey Moore came along and did a brilliant piece of work and said it doesn't look like this, it actually looks like this. You've got a chasm. Because there are always people who buy the latest new thing. And all these guys are concerned about is how it does it. They're not interested in what it will do for them, they want to know how it does it. It's like the guys who buy cars and spend the entire time taking the engines apart, whereas the rest of us regard a car as a way of getting someone to do something more interesting, right? You know the phenomenon? Yeah. What then happens is they project sales like this, and of course it doesn't happen because these guys buy very differently. They buy what it will do for me. So they don't want to know how it does it, and they don't want to be the first, but they want something which will give them first mover advantage. They don't want lots of cases. These guys want cases. These guys don't want cases. They want a proof point, but they want to, and the sales style, startup companies always get this wrong. They carry on saying how they do something. They don't say what it will do. Yeah, and if you don't make that switch, you fall into the chasm, and a lot of companies fall over. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is to combine that with S-curves. So if we look at the early stage of computing, what we get is a pattern like this. So the novel idea comes in. This is the 2.5%. There's always people who buy the idea. It then falls into the chasm. It then grows. It then reaches maturity. Now, this is my bit of original work. The reason you get the chasm is the previous idea is reaching maturity. So it's coming to the end of its natural limit, but it's the way everybody does things. Nobody gets fired from buying, buying IBM. Nobody gets fired from implementing the McKinsey's report. It's a safe solution. So it's the top of the predator chain, and therefore it suppresses the new idea. It's running out of utility, so there's space for something new, but it's difficult for the new thing to get entry. So if we look at this, and I'll go through the history of computing briefly on this, 1920s, IBM becomes the apex predator in computing. 
The reason is it repurposes punch cards. That repurposing concept is key. It takes an existing capability, which it developed for sewing machine control, and it reuses it to create a new approach to managing computers. Anybody remember punch cards? Yeah, at school we were actually taught how to use a punch card machine until we'd have a job for life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they're doing the same these days. They're, kid, they're teaching kids Java programming at schools. By the time the kids graduate, that would be so out of date, it's incredible. We should really be teaching them things like anthropology and design because that might have utility. Right? Uh, we're always sort of running in the past. Yeah? So basically, they do that and then they become the apex predator. You can't move against IBM. Yeah, I remember trying to sell VAX clusters against IBM. It was better kit, but you couldn't win against the apex predator. What then happens is gradually hardware becomes a commodity. Remember that point I made about a commodity? The trouble is the apex predator is immune from the weak signals. Because they're the dominant predator, they can still command a margin. Their competitors go first. So they don't see the change coming. And guess what happens? Microsoft take over. And you remember IBM paid Bill Gates to steal somebody else's idea to create an operating system for the IBM PC. And then Bill Gates realized he could repurpose it because IBM thought software was useless. So they gave him the IP. And he created Windows. And actually at that point, IBM almost disappeared. They recovered, but never at the same level. The whole of the British computer industry went under at that point. Yeah, because it was hardware dependent in the way it worked. And then Microsoft, the same principle. Yeah, they actually thought software was there, they were the apex predator, everybody had Windows. Software starts to become free. All right, and they don't see it until it's too late, and they get displaced by Apple. And Apple repurposed Next. The fact that Next went bankrupt, and I had a part in that, I'm still quite proud of that. Steve Jobs threw a pile of books at me, it's one of my claims to fame. Right? <laughs> the only time I met him, he threw a pile of books at me. I'm still proud of that one. Right? I'll tell a story later over a beer. But basically what happened is, how what Apple realized, and this is an anthropological phrase, which is worth IT people thinking about, he realized that what people wanted were objects of material desire. It's a lovely phrase. What they wanted is something beautiful which did something they didn't know they wanted, but now they couldn't do without. And it didn't matter about the hardware and the software. No consumer is remotely interested in open systems. Yet that's a tacky obsession. Yeah? They actually realized they could produce, and actually that precursor, if you think about it, to the Internet of Things. Hardware and software are less relevant these days than they used to, and now they're the dominant predator. You see what happens? These cycles go through. Now that's where Agile is. So the big question for us is Agile is now here. What's coming here? Yeah, do we reinvent Agile? Do we repurpose Agile? Do we bring in new things? But the commodification is now extreme. And by the way, just to scare you, it also happens in politics. What neoliberalism did in Germany, in Britain, in America, is it commoditized politics. So there was no difference between the major political parties. That means extremists can come in left field at very low energy cost. It's what we saw in the Weimar Republic, it's what we've seen with Trump and everything else. So commodification is an early sign that things are going to change. Okay, so that's the context. Now, what I want to do is to do a couple of things. I want to talk about how methods fit together, because this is part of where I think we need to go, is to move into a multi-methods approach rather than a single methods approach. And basically, it's almost like object orientation. Methods should have defined input outputs so they can, can be combined readily. And one of the things we're doing with Cognitive Edge, along with companies like Agile 42 and others, is we're looking to create some international standards around this. Now notice, we're doing it with competitors. If you want to create an international standard, you need competitors to work together, not one company to try and make it proprietary. If anybody's interested in that, get in touch with myself or Andrea. But this is where we move into the Kinevin framework. Yeah. That's the other picture from Animal Farm. Remember they have the laws. This is rather like the laws of Agile, right? So, you know, no animals will drink, right? And so on, right? All animals are equal, but then 
Yeah, they go up and write on it, but some animals are more equal than others. Yeah, one of these days I'm going to complete a version of the Agile Manifesto, which is snowboard on the wall, right? <laughs> so this is the Canadian framework. How many people have come across Canadian? Okay, how many people have heard the children's party story? Okay, right, I'll do the basic performance then, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's actually an important teaching story. There are three types of system which exist in nature, yeah? Um, fundamentally, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. And there's a phase shift between them. So a chaotic system is one without any constraints, so behavior is random. That means it's not a natural state of affairs. To create randomness takes a lot of energy. An ordered system is one with a very high level of constraint, so everything is predictable. And in a complex system, everything is connected, but we don't know what the connections are. In some cases, we talk about what's called a dark constraint. You can see the impact of something, but you can't see what's causing it. That's like dark matter in cosmology. Yeah? So in a complex system, everything is somehow or other connected, but you can't know the connections. In an ordered system, everything is connected, but you know the nature of the connections, you know the nature of the containment. Yeah? Now, those are three different types of system, and we manage them in a radically different way. The easiest way I've ever learned to explain this is to think about how you would organize a party for a bunch of nine-year-old children. Can everybody imagine this? Okay, and you're making the fundamental error of holding it in your own house. <laughs> this is something you grow out of pretty fast as a parent, all right? Community centers are much better for parties because they have fire hoses. <laughs> fire hoses are very useful for clean up after parties and are occasionally necessary for crowd control during the parties. <laughs> I speak to a nation that invented water cannon yet, so I need to be careful. Right? Um, so either way, let's look at how we organize a children's party based on what type of system it is. So if you assume the system is chaotic, that means there are no constraints on the children, their behavior is entirely random. That means they'll discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. <laughs> your house may burn down in the process, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place. <laughs> Sorry, there's a stiletto in that for some academic colleagues. So why are you worried about it? I've got a friend who actually did this. He was, came back from Burning Man all enthusiastic about spontaneous <laughs> self-organization and discover that spontaneous self-organization in children is very close to spontaneous combustion. <laughs> so I don't recommend that the recovery cost is high. Uh, the order systems on approach, on the other hand, is taught in nearly all management schools and was extensively practiced in IBM. Under this, it's of critical importance to agree learning objectives to the party in advance of the party itself. The learning objections, objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education in the community to which you belong. And the learning objectives should be clearly articulated and printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping in ponds. <laughs> and the posters should be placed around the room where you're going to hold the party. Yeah? Um, you then, as the children come into the party, you give them Disney playing cards with the party value statement clearly printed on the back of the card so they're aware of it at all times. You have, of course, produced a project plan for the party. The project plan has clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against idealized party outcomes. And a senior adult starts the party with a motivational DVD. You don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives. And then they use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives and to demonstrate to the children how their allowances are linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after action review, update your best practice database on party management and mandate future process improvements. If at this stage, for any remote reason, the children aren't happy, <laughs> Then you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner or Jürgen Apollo, and they'll end up very, very happy. Yeah? They won't have learned anything, but they'll be happy. Yeah? Now, that actually is a fundamental error. Yeah? On the other hand, the complex systems approach is much simpler. We start off, we draw a line in the sand, if you know that British phrase, a boundary constraint. We look the children squarely in the eye, 
and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of breaking catastrophically when you least expect them, particularly if your kids have got the intelligence, right? We then introduce catalytic probes. We might bounce in a football, yeah? Barbecue, computer game, DVD, something like that. That's called a catalyst. If it produces a favorable pattern of play, that's called an attractor. You can't create attractors, you can only catalyze them. If it's a good one, you push more kids towards it. Yeah, so football outside in the summer, put kids towards it. Football inside your dining room with your waterfall crystal in winter, you probably try and suck energy away from it, all right? Context is different. And so what we actually do is we manage, you know, if you've got a negative attractor, well, that's where you deploy the fire hoses. So what we actually do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. Get the principle? We manage the only things you can manage in a complex system, the constraints, the catalysts, and the amplification strategy. Now, the implications of that on things like software delivery and software design are huge. Because the essence of a complex system is you can't know in advance what will happen. The same thing will only happen again the same way by accident, and everything you do changes the nature of the system. So the big difference between complexity thinking and systems thinking which preceded it, systems thinking defines goals and tries to achieve the goals. Complexity thinking describes the present and tries to shift the present in a more favorable direction. <laughs> and that actually is a huge difference if you think about it, and it's a really important one. So, from with that, we come on to the Kinevin framework. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, Kinevin divides order into two. Um, one's where the relationship between cause and effect is obvious, and where it's complicated. Now, the difference is, if it's obvious, in the Germany, well, in Germany, you drive on the right-hand side of the road. In the UK, we drive on the left. Yeah? It's a simple decision model. Where am I? What type of country it is? So I sense, I categorize, respond, and I apply best practice. Nothing wrong with that. Huge value. Yeah? It's not rigid. If you made it too rigid, then you'd end up here. So if you said, drive on the left, even if a child runs on the road in front of you, some IBM regulations felt like that at times, then the system will actually break catastrophically. It falls over the edge into chaos. And there's lots of examples on this. Um, a last story, because I need to get on complete. But um, IBM took over the company I worked for. We were an Anglo-Dutch-German company. We had an office in Aachen, an office in Netherlands, an office in the UK. Um, we had four levels of management, and we were small type. We were a systems integrator. And we were sold to IBM literally in 48 hours. We were about to float the company. We spent a year saving up for that. And IBM appeared 48 hours to be a part of IBM. It was quite a shock to the system, right? Um, I could walk into the managing director's office and talk to him anytime. IBM didn't work like that, at least not initially. Right? So anyway, so we discovered that IBM is different. The first thing they did was to actually charge us for coffee and ban alcohol. Uh, this is completely unreasonable, right? And the coffee alcohol cycle is critical to good software development. Nobody should be expected to talk to users without alcohol first. You then need coffee to sober up to write the code. Then you need even more alcohol because users never want what you can prove they asked for. When you give it them, they want something else instead. Partly because they don't know what technology can do. So that was a problem. We got around that. Then it got worse. They banned us for buying food for staff. Yeah, no food may be bought for staff. Now, by now, we'd learned that you didn't argue against IBM on rational, empirical bound grounds based on customer or employee need. That didn't work, right? The only thing which occasionally worked was what's called a Socratic technique in philosophy. You asked them questions until they contradicted themselves, and sometimes they would then change. Now, if you know your history of philosophy, you know this is a very dangerous technique. Sooner or later, the people of Athens get fed up, accuse you of corrupting the young, and ask you to commit suicide, right? But 
Yeah, you know, but it's still fun while you do it. <laughs> so we went in and we said, you know, we would never have thought of banning food for staff. This is obviously one of the major advantages of being part of IBM. And then you realize that irony is an unknown quality in the US, so you can switch it on and off with HTML code in private chat lines during conference calls. I recommend that, by the way, it's a lot of fun. Right? Switch it on, switch it off, see how they respond. And we said, what happens? And I said, you know, I'm a C-level exec now, right? And I was. Uh, so I'm strategy director. I, I only see ed clients when they're really angry. You know, the higher you get promoted, the more you only meet angry clients. Because, you know, they keep the nice ones for themselves. It's when they can't cope with it, they push it up, right? So I said, I was on call, you know, two nights ago. Four o'clock in the morning, I come out. We got a 999 service, an emergency service on the VAX cluster. The operating system has failed on the upgrade because you bloody idiots wouldn't allow us to pay $500 to train somebody. You said they could learn it from the manual when they needed to. Yeah? Yeah, no, you'd be amazed what we we're putting up with, all right? And I said, so, you know, all I can do as an exec is keep everybody away from the systems programmers so they can just do their job and not be pestered with people asking them. And all I can do is keep them awake by buying them pizza and coke. So what do I do? And they looked quite disturbed, and I realized they might have misinterpreted that. So I said, I do mean Coca-Cola. <laughs> and there was, shall we say, a sigh of relief, but it did give us an idea or two. Yeah? Um, and they said, OK, we understand that might be necessary. Vice presidential approval, 48 hours in advance, and you can buy food for staff. Now, at this point, you have to breathe very, very deeply. Right? You know what you want to say. You say, God, that's brilliant. We would never, ever have thought of that. And now you realize that sarcasm can be added to irony as a weapon. And it doesn't, you know, they just don't get it. Right? Um, we said, what happens on the extremely rare occasion where we don't get 48 hours notice of a major crisis? <laughs> you ask questions. And they sort of looked a bit disturbed on that, and then they said yes in a way which means no. <laughs> Bureaucrats are brilliant at this. They said country general manager approval after the event. Now, if you work for IBM, you know that means your expenses will disappear into the South Bank office, they'll never be signed, and if you complain about it, your name will appear on the wrong sorts of lists. Right? <laughs> and you don't want to be on those lists at quarter end where they're trying to reduce cost. So the practice emerged, and I hasten to add that I never did this, and no friend of mine would ever think of it, all right? I just heard about this on the rumor mill. Uh, the practice emerged of over-tipping a London taxi driver, and if you over-tip a London taxi driver, they give you a blank receipt. The blank receipt, I'm told, was then filled out for the amount of food and drink bought by the staff. A parallel set of books were kept so the expenditure could be proved, and the responsible manager took a blood bus and submitted a taxi receipt. Now, I gave that example at the Scrum Alliance conference in Berlin a few years ago. Three people from IBM ran up to me afterwards, showed me their wallets full of blank receipts. <laughs> I said, we're still doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you over-constrain a system, it will break, but you won't see that it's broken. Based on a lot of work we've done, we think there's 20% of cost to be taken out of any large company simply by reducing the needless regulation. And we've just done one of the most scary projects of my life in the northeast of England, working with police firearm squads, ambulance drivers, and fire officers. We discovered the principal cause of mental breakdown is not the job, but the health and safety rules. It's the regular, and they're trying to patch it over with two-day mindfulness courses. Right? So either way, chaos is a bad place. If you end up there, you act, sense, respond, the good news is you get novelty. In a complex world, over here, that's where I probe sense respond, but I probe in parallel, not in sequence. Remember Hawthorne effect? If I do one experiment, it will work. What I need to do is lots of parallel experiments and see what happens. Yeah? Over here, I sense, analyze, respond, and I apply good practice, not best practice. Yeah. Over here, practice is emergent, or a new word for you, exactive. That's the biology, biological term for repurposing. So a dinosaur's feathers, and if you don't know it, you can, this is good news if you've got young kids into dinosaurs. 
because their textbooks aren't up to date. So you can get one over on them, right? All dinosaurs had feathers. Yeah, we've just discovered that on fossils in northern, northern China and elsewhere. Right? So basically, if dinosaurs' feathers re evolved for sexual display or warmth, then they repurpose for flight. Yeah? Flight couldn't happen in an evolutionary pathway because if dinosaurs flew themselves off cliffs in the hope of developing feathers before they hit the ground, it wouldn't work. <laughs> the feathers have to develop some other purpose, so when dinosaurs fall off cliffs, those with lots of feathers glide. Yeah? And that's actually a really important principle. I just gave you several examples like IBM and punch cards. Yeah? So basically, if I use this to look at agile methods, uh, Scrum, this is the liminal version of Kinevin, this actually defines transitionary spaces, Scrum sits here. Scrum is a linear iterative method based on a partial definition to get it right. So its huge strength and power is its ability to shift things from the complex to the complicated. But it can only shift them when they're on the boundary zone, it doesn't do stuff in the other area. So I'll give you three things to give you an illustration on this, and I'm going to wind this up. Uh, one of the methods which we developed 20 years ago, this was mine in DSDM. DSDM was the first consortium around Agile, before the Agile Manifesto. Um, it was formed in a pub in Cheltenham by myself, my equivalent in Logica, and somebody from Cambridge Scientific. That's how I got started. Yeah. Um, one of the methods we developed was called Triple Eight. So we'd use a rat, a, ja a jab team. So that's a bunch of prototypers with a bunch of users one day intensive workshop. And by the way, the thing we discovered on that is good prototypers are crack coders. And yeah, the really good prototypers, you don't want an operational project, but they're brilliant at throwing things together quickly. It's kind of like a different skill base. So we'd run a JAG team over eight hours and we'd produce a working prototype in the UK. We'd then throw it to a team in Mumbai without any sight of the original user requirement and give them eight hours to improve it and add features. Then they throw it on to a team in San Francisco who would do the same thing. And 16 hours later, it came back to the UK. Every time users looked at that, they said, God, we wouldn't have thought of it. Can we please have it? Because what we did, is a, there's a British game called Chinese Whispers. You whisper something into one ear, they whisper to the next one. Under conditions of uncertainty, mutation rates in biology increase. So what we did was to increase the mutation so that novelty emerged. Yeah. And the other ones we're now doing is, is called triplets. So that's where we take a pair programming team. Oh, know about pair programming? And we add to it the third. Pairs aren't stable. Triplets are stable. The third thing we add to it is a user trained to talk to IT people. Oh. Just to be clear, it's almost impossible to train good IT people to understand users, but it's fairly easy to train users to speak to IT people. Mm. We're actually repurposing how to deal with your Spurger syndrome trial material to do it, all right? But you've got to be very structured. So we create a triplet, and basically we throw 15, 20, 30 triplets at a problem and see what they come up with. Yeah? That's actually a downside cheaper than traditional user requirements. But. And the other big one, this is the big area we're working on, is you get users to diarize frustrations over four or five months. And when those frustrations start to cluster together, then you put a pair of programming team on the clusters. So the programming team is then working directly with user frustrations without interpretive layers. And what you're doing there is you're matching known technology capability against unarticulated needs. So one of the massive problems we've got in IT at the moment is that technology can do things users don't know how to ask for. Yeah? The, the, the pace of change of technology is so high, we can't go back to that original manifesto. So those are examples, and they're all examples of getting this space right. If you get this space right, this stuff is easier. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with waterfall. There's nothing wrong with three-month time boxes. Yeah, different methods work in different domains because you have different levels of uncertainty. And the idea that one method can do it, I mean, Kanban's a classic case, right? 
Um, I famously said Kanban isn't a complex systems technique, and Dave Anderson got really angry. Uh, I said that it's not difficult to get Dave Anderson really angry, but <laughs> and he said it is. And I said it isn't because it's a linear representation. You have cards, you move them around a linear way by definition. That's actually complicated. But actually, if you look at what really matters on Kanban, it's about work in progress. So stop thinking about the representation and think about the underlying concept. This is a method in its own right. Work in progress in the complex space manifests as unrealized potential applications. So it has to be represented on what's called a fitness landscape, i.e. cloud of potentialities. I'll show you one in a minute. Not a series of structured tasks. And backlog is radically different in a complex space and a complicated space. So again, it's different things. And the famous British phrase, horses for courses. Okay, I need to start to pull this together. The other big thing that you see a lot in Agile is the culture word. Anybody heard that one? Yeah, how do we create an Agile culture or an Agile mindset, right? Anybody heard that one? Yeah, it's very common, right? Uh, agile people think this is an original problem. I've been hearing this for 50 years, right? If something doesn't go wrong, the problem is people's culture isn't right. <laughs> yeah? I've got this wonderful new corporate initiative. You don't like it, you've got the wrong culture. Yeah, I've got this wonderful new Agile methodology, I've been really excited by it, but the users don't buy it, their culture's wrong. Yeah, I can't get people to buy into my particular method, their culture's wrong. Yeah? The reality is culture isn't something you can engineer, culture is an emergent property of multiple interactions over time. So the illustration is again something we're doing at the moment, anybody come across Gaping Boy? Okay, this is one of his illustrations. They're not cartoons, they're illustrations. I've learned the hard way on that. He doesn't like them to be called cartoons. <laughs> yeah? Basically, you can subscribe to this, right? So if you go onto Gaping Boyd's site, you can get a daily cut, daily illustration down. Yeah? He had a wonderful one once, which is, don't try and sell a meteor to a dinosaur, it only offends. And the one, I, my favorite one of all time, is same cross, different nails. Yeah, that makes you think about things. And that's actually what these things do. So what you do is, you, we just completed, we had a big brainstorm of most of the Agile Thought leaders over a weekend. And we've just produced a culture wall of Agile-based illustrations, which is going to go public in a few weeks' time. Yeah, so 50 cartoons, I'll use my own phrase, which illustrate the different Agile tribes and Agile beliefs. It's, it's very, very funny, right? Everybody brainstormed, they came back with it, they got the first review copy with me at the moment. So what happens is we get people to choose six or seven of those which they think represent the range of culture. And everybody in the organization chooses the cartoon which most represents the culture they see present. They tell a story about why they chose it, and then they interpret it into what's called high abstraction metadata. This is a cognitive edge patent. And you've all done employee satisfaction surveys? Have we done employee satisfaction survey? Okay, well I got one in IBM, all right, and it came in and it said, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, ten all the time? Now you know exactly what answer they want, don't you? Yeah? So if you've got any intent, you know, so you either give them zero or ten, or if you're statistically literate, you know they the element outliers, so you make it two or eight, right? To get it through. Either way, I found up HR. And I was on a watch list, all right? I completed a six-month process. They paid for it. Uh, they were really angry with me. They tried to have me fired over this. We proved that astrology is more accurate than Myers-Briggs in <laughs> predicting team behavior. Yeah. Um, we had to, we'd expected it to be effective, but it was the most effective of the methods we tested, right? And we basically cast people's horoscopes, including how they work together as a team. And it's well known that Virgos make good deputies to Aries, but Taurians don't. I mean, regrettably, that's been true all my life, so I worry about that one. Right? Um, and then we recast the, the, the horoscope in management speak, and then after six months, we asked people which of the psychometric tests was the most accurate. Astrology went hand down. As I point out, astrologers have had centuries of saying things with the right level of ambiguity, so you fill in the gaps. It's more recent with Myers Briggs. So, either way, it had me on a watch list, all right? So, I get straight through to the worldwide head. Um, she says, What are you doing now? All right? You can tell this is an antagonistic relationship. And I said, Well, I don't know how to answer this question. I said, I've got three formal managers, five people I take business direction from, and three people I know are going to do what they say regardless. 
And I said, sometimes they consult me and sometimes they don't, and sometimes they should and sometimes they shouldn't. So how do I answer this? He said, average your experience over the year and stop causing trouble and slam the phone down on me. Uh, which is probably good for my soul because I was about to tell her what I really thought of somebody in the research department who could come up with that. We take a different approach, right? So we give you a cartoon or ask you for the story you would tell your best friend if they were off the job in your company. Yeah, that's called a non-hypothesis question. And it gives you narrative material. And then people interpret it onto a series of triangles. So one of the triangles says the manager's behavior was altruistic, assertive, analytical. See, three positive qualities? That causes a... Co we've actually wired people up for this, by the way. This causes a cognitive load, which means it moves into a different part of the brain for processing. They start to think slow, not think fast, to use the popular language. Or novelty receptive, not autonomic processing, if you want the science. So, six triangles, 18 data points. From that, I can draw a fitness landscape. And that's actually a map of culture at the present. Yeah, that one's looking at a couple of aspects here. Yeah? Uh, interests of themselves, interests of the team, against the people involved, were free to do what they wanted, um, were told what to do. This is a, an actual project. Now each of those contour maps represents a dispositional state. If you've got tightly clustered contour lines, things will find it difficult to escape. If the contour lines are loosely coupled, it's easy to escape. Now this actually says this is what life's like, guys. So in theory, if we take this group, I kind of like, like to be up here, and 13% is there. I don't want to be down here. That is too big a distance. A classic cultural change program starts with where you want people to be, but it's too far away from where people are. This here is called an adjacent possible. It's something close to where we are, which is a stepping stone. So I click on that. That shows me the stories people told. And I say, what can we do tomorrow to create more stories like these, fewer stories like those? And that's a whole new theory of change. And you can engage any number of people in that because it's not abstract principles. What do we do tomorrow to create more like this, fewer like that? People can come up with things. And this is also what's called fractal management. You show the board of the company, the whole company. You show a department, their own department maps. So everybody is moving in a direction appropriate to a context in which they can make an action. Yeah? And that changes things. Right? Um, you can actually see on this project, by the end of the project, we actually had achieved a significant shift. Yeah, we'd reduced that in size. Yeah? Now that is what complexity is all about. It's mapping the present, identifying where you can change, and then shifting the thing and getting a feedback loop. If I can't create an adjacent possible, then I say, what could I do to create stories here so that I could shift things in that direction? You're always working with the reality of how people are rather than anything else. So the basic goal is quite simple. We live in turbulent times, but you can create stable points within that. Yeah? The issue is when is stability good, when you should actually be instable, when do you paddle a kayak, and when do you build a bridge? Yeah? Try and build a bridge in a fast-flowing stream. You're dead, a kayak is better. Yeah? So you've actually got to think about different approaches. And a final warning on this, because from my point of view, I think Agile, in terms of its current understanding, is probably dead, but the need for agility has never been stronger. So we need to think about agility, not Agile. Yeah, the brand has been taken away. And really, the danger is, and this is what we're seeing now, my favorite quote from T.S. Eliot, yeah, and I'll read it out, nothing pleases people more than to go on thinking what they have already thought and at the same time imagine they are thinking something new and daring. It combines the advantage of security and the delight of adventure. That's 90% of agile practice. <coughs> they construct huge methods, safe as a typical, you know, which claim wonder, but nothing really changes. Or it doesn't change on a sustainable basis. We've actually got to start to understand the theory in order to practice better. It's not just what I did last time which worked for me, 
It's what can work on a sustainable, resilient basis. And critically, it's about mapping the present with real-time feedback loops and nudging the system in the right direction rather than trying to yank it towards a preconceived end goal. Thank you very much for your time. I think you get questions, but you've got to use the mic, all right? Or you can just go back to the beer. I'm quite relaxed with either option. I'll go along with it. <laughs> Anything anybody wants to ask? Anybody want to have an argument about something? I'm quite happy to have an argument. That's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, down here. Uh, it's a more, a little bit deeper. Um, I saw in your trainings uh, about the SenseMaker projects that you did for Singapore, and it was very impressed for me that you work with the SenseMaker and the pictures, and you, you see what kind of futures we want to have in uh, Singapore. And it's uh, 2013, I saw the, the last uh, presentation, and what happened there with, this, with your complex theory and SenseMaker in Singapore? I need to be careful here because that's a government project, right? Um, what we actually found in Singapore is that the, what we did there is having gathered stories from the street, we presented them to civil servants and we found a disconnect and I won't say any more than that. And the disconnect varied by age. So civil servants over 50 actually were quite close to citizens, under 50 were far away from it. And that's partly because the older civil servants have lived through hell when Singapore was expelled from Malaysia whereas the younger civil servants have only ever known power, right? But this is actually quite... I'm going to give an illustration. We were working on um, Roma kids in Hungary. Now, the Roma problem is a big issue on racism all over Eastern Europe. So we had Roma kids acting as ethnographers to Roma. First time anybody's done it. So Roma kids would go to adults in the community and ask them for the stories of their life that the adult thought the child should remember. This is something we've done in Pakistan and elsewhere. And we got powerful data, and then we took clusters of narrative indexed the same way by the kids and gave it to the anthropologists in Vienna responsible for the European programs on Roma. And they indexed it, and there was no correspondence between the way they indexed the stories and the way that Roma indexed their own stories. You know what their response was? They don't understand their own stories. They've indexed their stories wrongly. And that's actually quite common. Right? One of the things we're now doing is to present infographics yeah, to different groups of people. Get all of those. We're just doing this on cyber. Let's take cyber security. That's a big issue. Because one of the things we want to do is measure attitudes. Because attitudes are lead indicators. Compliance is a lag indicator. So if you can measure attitudes and intervene early, your cost is very low. If you wait for compliance, you can't trust the results. So this was with the UK government. So we presented an infographic about the Yahoo security breach. We then got civil servants, because we wouldn't present a government one because they'd panic. So they then told the story about why it couldn't happen here and indexed it in the triangles there we worked on with one of the UK security agencies. So the theory base was sound. And then they told a scenario about what would happen if it did. Now, from that, we could draw the maps to show attitudes to cybersecurity. And we could go to managers and say, what could you do to create more stories like this and fewer stories like that before we got a breach? Yeah, we're doing the same on attitudes to testing, all right? Attitudes to safety. And the key thing in a complex system is the earlier you can see that something is starting to go in the wrong direction, the lower the cost of intervention. Yeah, and that, that would be another illustration. Yeah? Same data, multiple, multiple respondents. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, actually, I'm a bit confused right now, so... Oh, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So there are like a lot of stuff has been told like uh, we know nowadays like uh, uh, adopting agile methodologies is something of modernization for companies and making life much nicer and so on. 
But yeah, after this talk, I realized that there could be uh, a kind of thing that's being missed, like many companies treat agility or agile methodologies as a set of rules, not as a culture. And if you are going to work for a certain company, they ask you for the set of rules and how you are going to uh, adopt that or how you are going to follow this rather than the culture itself. So if you could clarify a bit more about this and trying like to, what could be the right approach to convince companies nowadays how we can go forward and um, rely on culture rather than just like set of rules. Because at the end there should be KBIs and metrics yes that, and no. that govern success and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So hang on, let me I just need another slide, so give me a second. Yeah. Okay. So go back to Kinevin, right? Remember that? Yeah? Here you have rigid rules. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? Rules are entirely appropriate, yeah? Here you have effectively boundary conditions. So if I have the right expertise, I can make decisions. If I don't have the right expertise, I can't. Yeah, so that's a different sort of space. Over here, you have heuristics or rules of thumb. Now, I'll give you a military example. Um, this originally came from Napoleon. So he basically said, if in doubt, march to the sound of the guns. Yeah, that's a heuristic. And it gives self-managing principles because you know roughly what to do. You know what other people around you are doing. And with the US Marines, it's capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. I've just completed a project for a major fashion house. And we've extracted the heuristics their designers use. And we've codified them with teaching stories as an alternative to rule-based prescription because it's highly volatile, right? But you've still got a control mechanism, right? Over here, you have outcome-based targets. Yeah, so you define what you want because you've got an ordered system which is predictable. Over here, you have vector targets because you can't predict what the future state would be. So if I look at that landscape map I drew, this was, those are my attractor wells, what I can say is an vector measures direction and speed of travel for intensity of effort. So I can say by the end of the year, I want that minus 15% and that plus 30%. And that's your target. That's ungameable. Outcome-based targets are easy to gain. Now, in the average British hospital at the moment, we have 511 outcome-based targets with 22% of the budget going on managing the measurement system and with people gaming the targets. Yeah? I mean, I turned up at a hospital in Bangor. I, made, I, I fell on Triven on the mountain, never go up on a very rocky climb early in the morning. All right? um, I did a nosedive and slit. My, my, it ended up with eight stitches. And I'm really unpopular with my family on this because I was conscious when I fell, so I knew I was okay. And I knew head wounds, well... I went down two meters, landed on my forehead, and slipped down sharp rock, all right, and did an arrest. So there's blood everywhere. Um, so I climbed down a thousand feet, all right, get to a stream, decide I'll just take a picture before, um, yeah. Um, either way, shall we say that I looked at the picture and I thought, oh shit, I need to go into hospital. Then I composed the perfect tweet for this picture, which is Red Dawn on Triven, and I couldn't, you know, couldn't not do that, all right. And the family never forgave me. The first they realized I had an accident is they saw this thing go on a Twitterverse with Red Dawn on Triven. Yeah? Um, which shall we say, actually, you might as well see it just to give you a horror factor. Yeah? Um, it's here somewhere. Um, now I'll find it. Ah, oh, there we are. No. Ah, I know it's here. Yeah. So I took that and I thought, oh my God, I've got a problem, all right? <laughs> so from there, I sort of walked down a thousand feet here, yeah? um, 
Can I did get better, all right? Um, walked down a thousand feet, all right? Got to the car park um, and decided I'd drive to hospital, right? <laughs> Um, so I was admitted to hospital, and the trouble is I was a walk-in. If I'd been brought in by ambulance, I'd have been seen immediately. But because I was a walk-in, I was subject to a triage queue, and the hospital has a target that everybody must be seen within four hours, and there were three people ahead of me who'd been there for three hours and a half hour with minor complaints. I was bleeding all over the sofa, so they gave me some towels, all right? And I wasn't seen for an hour. If I'd been admitted in an ambulance, I could have been seen immediately. And that's the sort of thing you get, all right? Managers become extremely adept at gaming targets. Yeah? But a vector measure, you can't game. Yeah? The other thing is you can't define a culture. This is a basic mistake people make. You see it all over Agile. They write a series of platitudes, say we want a sharing culture, a transparent culture, a culture which admits its own mistakes. You've all heard it. Uh, that's actually specious. What you can do is say more stories like this and fewer stories like that and see if you get them. And that's a vector measure, right? So one of the other problems is agile people keep trying, in effect, to get rid of this stuff. There's nothing wrong with order. There's nothing wrong with rules and processes if you've got predictability. There's nothing wrong with waterfall. We've got to stop this... I have got the solution to life, the universe, everything. You know, this is Mosin coming down from the mountain with the Agile Manifesto. I'm yeah, wondering why people have been working on fatted calves while he's been away. All right? Sorry, biblical background on this. Right? Um, Agile is a name for a set, a collection of methods and tools without a really coherent philosophy. That's its problem, all right? Um, it needs a coherent philosophy. It also needs to recognize that other things work. We just know their limits. And the whole, it's called bounded applicability. Most of what executives are doing are right. It's just right within boundaries. They need to do something different on the other side of the boundary. Sorry about showing the horror picture, but um, <laughs> it will get me sympathy later. Right? And Red Dawn on Triven was just perfect for that. All right? I just couldn't not tweet that. So if you are highly against, uh, how you call it, certification, how do you teach people Agile systems? Okay. Um, there are several ways, all right? First of all, you can't teach anybody anything in a two-day course with a multi-choice questionnaire. All right, just forget it, all right? I mean, it's just bad cognitive science, right? Um, we're currently, actually, we just spent about five years working on this, so we've just announced a certification scheme. And I blogged on it recently, but it's very different, right? So basically, you actually do a, we just, the first tranche on this has just started. You do five two-week online courses with clinics where you get exercises, right? No certificate is granted, yeah? You then have to keep a narrative-based journal of all of your experiences during that. You have to participate in the wiki on the methods and we can measure your participation and how often you were reverted. And you have to have a 360 feedback tool with your clients and your colleagues. Okay. Yeah? And you also have to declare a form of learning outside the context of our methods that you will pursue, like OD or Agile or something like that. Yeah? After two or three years, we got the metrics to give you some sort of an award. Yeah? But it's a mixture of theory and practice, and you've got to prove your ability to do both. Yeah? And that requires some sort of discipline. Um, interestingly, Scott, um, the, the, the Discipline Agile Framework guy, he was on our first trainer-trainer course the other day in Whistler um, because he's got the same problem. He hasn't got this really simplistic, come here, get this name. He's actually thinking about stuff. So we're starting to consolidate a lot of that work in. But you need a mix... I said to the course earlier, there's if you look at the professions, there's two types of knowledge. Yeah? Nurses acquire practical experience, then gain theory. Doctors start with theory, then gain practice. You see the same in the army, the same in lawyers. The two knowledge bases are different, and they need to coexist. Yeah? And that's one of the things we need to do in IT. We need to have practitioners who acquire theory and theoreticians who acquire practice, and we need both in place. 
Any more? You've got an unfair advantage. You've been on a three-day training course, all right? Yeah, I was there. <laughs> uh, can you explain a little more about the attractors? And when you, when I oh, see a course. modern um, <laughs> management theory, and you, you see, you, you don't, a lot of companies don't want to be more stable. We live in polarities, and um, I remember. Okay, there, I read there, a little bit. there are roughly <laughs> three types of attractor, which is worth thinking about. All right. So one is called a single point attractor. So think of that as like a basin. The important thing to, uh, to, to know about attractors is people fall into attractors, they're not sucked in. Yeah? It, it, it's rather like if you know anything about gravity, gravity creates wells that things fall into. It's not a pull. Yeah? So either way, so a single point is like a large bowl, and if you throw a bunch of small bowl, if you throw small balls into it, they'll end up at the bottom of the bowl. Right? If it's a very shallow bowl, they can escape easily. If it's a deep bowl, it's difficult. So that's called a single point attractor. A dual point attractor is where something <coughs> oscillates between two stable states. So the classic example is predator prey. If you have too many predators, prey dies out. So predators die out, so prey goes up. So you get this oscillation between two states. And the really interesting one in human systems, it's the best named phenomena in science, it's called a strange attractor. And they are actually bloody strange, right? So you can see it, nothing ever follows the same pathway, but the multiple pathways form a pattern which you can recognize. Yeah? Um, narrative is a form of strange attractor in human beings. Yeah? Part of the problem is people, it's called a trope. Yeah? It's what we got the problem with Trump and elsewhere, or with Brexit. People get sucked into a narrative pattern and they can't escape from it because it acts as a filtering mechanism. Yeah? Uh, if you really want to understand the English, and we live next door to them, so we've got to, you've got, <laughs> you know, you don't have to, but with our next door neighbours. The thing which produced Brexit can be summarised by a headline in the Daily Express in the 1950s. Fog in channel, Europe cut off. Yeah? Because there's this myth of the island race, the severe, and the trouble is it's difficult for people to escape that. Right? And Narrative forms a trope, an attractor mechanism that human beings find it very difficult to escape from, and those narratives are actually the way that culture expresses. So if you've got a deeply held set of narrative, it's very difficult for them to escape unless you disrupt it. Yeah? Okay. Any more, or are we over? Yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot. Dave Snowden, give him a hand.